Because the clarity is all set. Okay. So I'm gonna call the, it's Tuesday, April 28th. I want to call the town council meeting to order. Uh, I'm just taking care of some, you are correct. Moving some people over who need to be in the meeting. Sue, can you take care of that? Look at the list of attendees. There's some who need to be on the panel. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, for first, so if we could do a roll call, please, Clerk Sabino. Sure. I'll take care of that. Councillor Berica. Here. Councillor Connors. Here. Councillor Flaherty. I guess we'll turn in. Hold on one second. Here, I'm here. Thank you. Councilor Hume. Here. Councilor Mackin. Present. Councilor O'Brien. Present. Councilor Ringus. Here. Councilor Ryan. Here. Councilor Sasha. Here. All present. Um, and if I could, I know these Zoom meetings are a little different than our normal meetings, but I'd still like to have a moment of silence if we could, one for all of our men and women serving here and abroad, and also for all of those people who have lost their lives with COVID-19, and in particular, all the Braintree residents. Our thoughts go out to uh, all their families, and uh, we're thinking of all of them at times. So if we could have a moment of silence. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to begin with an announcement. Um, I want to thank Councilor Berica for bringing us forward, but also to Jimmy Joyce. Uh, there's not many times where we can say, um, be celebrating somebody's 100th birthday, and in addition to that, a veteran's 100th birthday. So it is uh, Nancy Carver is a brain Who resident. She is the niece of Joseph Shiner, who is celebrating his 100th birthday this April 30th, he's a World War II veteran. So given the circumstances, neither the family could be present here or Joseph Shiner, but Clerk Semino has prepared um, a nice plaque that will get over to um, Nancy Carver to give to her uncle. And uh, Jimmy Joyce also is the one, he's a South Middle School history teacher who Nancy reached out to him and got the word out. I did see it out on social media and also. So thank you to all those involved in spreading the word. But I'd just like to read this, um, uh, commendation that we will be sending over to him. The Braintree Town Council, in recognition of Joseph Shiner, is recognized by the Braintree Town Council as we extend our sincere best wishes for your 100th birthday celebration, April 30th, 2020. Congratulations and thank you as a World War II veteran for your dedication and years of service to our country. We wish you many years of continued health and happiness, and it's signed by all nine counselors. Uh, any other council have any any other announcement? Okay, seeing none. Moving on to approval of the minutes, February fourth, twenty twenty. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of February fourth, two thousand twenty? So moved. Second. It has been made by Councilor Ringus. Has been a seconded by Councilor Ryan. Clerk Semino, roll call, please. Councilor Berica. Yes. Councillor Connors? Yes. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Councillor Hume? Aye. Councillor Mackin? Aye. Councillor O'Brien? Yay. Councillor Ringus? Aye. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Sasha? Yes. Okay, thank you. Moving on to approval of minutes of February 25th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Second. There's been a motion made by Councillor Ringus. There's been a second by Councillor Ryan. Clerk Semino, roll call, please. Councillor Berica? Yes. Councillor Connors? Yes. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Councillor Hume? Yes. Councillor Mackin? Yay. Councillor O'Brien? Yay. Councilor Ringus? Aye. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Councilor Sasha? Yes. All in favor. Okay, thank you, Clark Semino. I believe that takes care of the minutes. Moving on to communications. So we are still, we have, uh, for those of you at home who are on video, 
there's also individuals on audio um, as attendees. We do have a panelist here. We will be speaking um, on the COVID. We have representatives from Mayor Kokoris' office, as well as all of our state legislatures, including Senator Keenan, Senator Timothy, and Representative Cusack. Uh, Mayor Kokoros, I will let you begin. If you wanna just introduce who is present here with your office, that would be great. Thank you, uh, Madam President. <clears throat> we have, uh, first of all, I just wanna give you an update. Uh, today's update, unfortunately, uh, we have 13 new confirmed cases, uh, and we have a total of 586 cases now here in Braintree. Uh, in addition, we have had four new deaths, uh, totaling uh, 65 lives lost um, here in Braintree due to the coronavirus. Um, so as, as far as the day-to-day -day meetings we have with our uh, coronavirus team, uh, the team is made up of myself, um, Nicole Taub, uh, Chief of Staff, uh, Chief O'Brien from the Fire Department, Chief Du Bois from the Police Department, uh, Health Director uh, Mary Beth McGrath, uh, Jean McGinty, uh, Mary Mulready, who are two nurses. So we meet every day, we get an update, we talk about uh, different issues that we have to resolve. Um, I don't know if everybody is aware of our mask uh, order that we have put out there. So anyone that is going into a business or a residence that has more than one unit, uh, they're required to wear a mask. Uh, and the business, uh, employees of the business are required to wear a mask as well uh, to reduce the transmission of this disease um, in the essential businesses. Um, as far as uh, the steps that we are taking, we know that the folks in Braintree are social distancing. And, and doing a really good job at it. Um, the majority of our cases, um, unfortunately, are in nursing homes and um, it's about 65% of our cases. So we know that we are at the peak and um, we have put into place uh, through Mary Beth and her staff, uh, a number of safeguards at supermarkets and other places where uh, you can only have a specific uh, number of people come into the store at a time. So there's police details at most of the supermarkets. Um, I think all of them except the Target at this point. And they are requiring people that come in to wear a mask. Uh, and if they do not have a mask, then they're not allowed in the store. So in addition to that, I just wanna say that one of the key focuses really on uh, containing this virus is tracing. And we've had a nurses brigade from the Braintree Public Schools that have been working day in and day out with our health department staff. And because of their assistance, we've been able to not only trace um, all of the folks that have had contact with folks that are um, sick with coronavirus, but also um, to lend the opportunity to comfort some of these people and call them and, and keep in touch with them. So there's just constant communication uh, that's going on downstairs. And, you know, I commend uh, Mary Beth uh, for all the hard work that she's done and really being prepared as our health director for this uh, pandemic. And um, I would say at this time, if Anyone have any questions? We do have um, Mary Beth is available as well as uh, uh, my chief of staff and, and anyone else that from staff that's here. And, and one last thing, we uh, the community, uh, the task force that was put together has done a great job. And at this point we are having, they're having an additional, uh, it, it's been like a Saturday event from 10 to 12 and there'll be a, um, there might be a robocall that goes out. So we will have the food and PPE drive Saturday uh, from 10 to 12 as well. So I just wanted to put that out. If you guys have any, uh, Madam President, if you have any comments or questions, um, as I said, my staff is here to uh, assist. Mary Beth, I know you were, I moved you over to the panel. Um, 
Do you want to add to anything that the mayor said? And I just want to thank you, Mayor Kokoros, as well as Mary Beth on your staff. I know this is a huge undertaking and the timeliness of information is appreciated with the daily updates and all. So we do appreciate it. Are you there, Mary Beth? Yes, I am. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I do reiterate what Mayor Kokoros has offered to you as far as our uh, surveillance response to the COVID epidemic or pandemic, I should say. The, my department, staff, my public health nurses, all of my inspectors are all doing an exceptional job to help with the COVID response. We're doing it under the direction of Mayor Kokoros, who's been an incredible support to all of us, as well as Nicole and our first responder departments, police and fire. All of us have worked very closely together to try and get this done. We're out there every day doing inspections, monitoring and enforcing on the governor's orders and the local orders that are in place by Mayor Kokoros. Everything seems to be going well. We have very, very positive support from the community, both businesses and residents. There are some that aren't as happy with us as we would like, but that's to be expected. But for the most part, everyone's been very responsive in a positive way. Well, thank you uh, for that. Uh, Councillor Verica. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Mayor Kokoros, and your team for all of the work you are all doing every single day. Um, I'm wondering, I've gotten several questions from residents in, uh, regarding um, potential violations at the compressor station, and, and maybe this is for you, Mayor Kokoros, or maybe um, one of our state legislators could help us understand Braintree's jurisdiction and what may be going on at the compressor station with lack of social distancing. Um, and I know there's been some concerns with people not quarantining when they come into the state. Can you provide us with a, some information on that? Well, I would, I would say um, that uh, because the compressor station is in Weymouth as far as the workforce itself, uh, that would fall under uh, Mayor Headland um in his uh, public health department uh, as far as uh, hotels i haven't gotten any verification uh, but i don't really have a list of of every person necessarily that's staying there um but there there is an allowance for essential workers uh, i think mostly medical workers uh, to stay within the hotels something we could look into uh, to find out um, any information in regards to if there are people coming from out of state, if they are, if they're traveling back and forth from out of state, that would be a concern for sure. Um, but that's something that we can certainly look into. But as far as the overall project and the lack of social distancing, that's something that really needs to be managed within, within the town uh, that they're in. Thank you. Thanks for the update, uh, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate it. I know a lot of residents were concerned, so that's helpful. As Senator Keenan, am I curious? Madam President, it's Mary Beth. Can I also jump in and onto Mayor Kokoris' comments? Yeah, there's a big echo on your end, Mary Beth. I don't know if everyone else is hearing that. Yeah, okay, they are. Yep. Is this, is this better? little bit. Okay. The, as Mayor Kokoros mentioned, the compressor station is in Weymouth. That is a federally regulated project and is allowed as an essential service. So that's not something that we can become involved with that it would be overseen as far as the social distancing by the town of Weymouth. As for any of the individuals working at that station, possibly staying at locations, hotel locations in Braintree as essential services, they would be allowed. We don't have any knowledge of where those individuals are from, but certainly it's the requirement of the agency that is hiring them to make sure that they have uh, construction site protocols in place to address the issues that are being mentioned, as well as social distancing requirements on the project. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, Senator Timothy, I know we have our state legislators here. I think Senator Timothy just wanted to say something. Are you? Was that you? No. Okay. 
All right, so I'm going to move on to Senator Keenan and Representative Cusack, if you want to address or update us anything on the uh, uh, COVID-19. Um, sure. Thank Senator you. And good evening, everybody. This is John Keenan. I thought I'd just hit on a, a couple of quick points. Um, as most of you are probably now aware, the governor announced today that the closing order is going to remain in effect through May 18th, and that uh, means essential services will remain as defined unless there's some changes over the next couple of weeks and uh, and only essential services will be allowed to operate. And also the limit on gathering size will remain at 10 across the state. And then also the governor is putting together an, a reopening advisory task force to, to look at ways to uh, ease our way into the reopening of the economy. The, the other uh, note, is as most of here that school has been canceled for the year throughout the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and daycare will be closed other than emergency daycares through the end of June. Third point is that unemployment remains the issue that certainly my office and I think my colleagues offices get calls on most often. Uh, there's been now about 650,000 claims in the Commonwealth for unemployment benefits and uh, to handle that, the state has added about a thousand new employees working in the call centers. With that, there are over 20,000 calls per day coming into the call center. They are working feverishly, and no pun intended, actually, sorry about that, uh, but they're working very hard to get those calls returned. They're able to return about 5,000 calls per day. So anybody who has filled out a contact form inquiring about the status of their unemployment claim, uh, please know that it is being worked on and you can expect a call. And uh, be aware that uh, when the call comes in, you may uh, look at it and say, I'm not gonna answer that, I do not know who it's from, but it'll be a call from the 617 area code. And you may wanna pick it up because otherwise you lose your spot in the queue and you fall further back waiting again for a return telephone call. The state continues to offer virtual town halls for those who need assistance with their unemployment claims. The next one is tomorrow. Then there's one Thursday at, uh, I believe, 2 p.m., Friday at 2.20 p.m., and then Saturday and Sunday uh, mid-afternoon as well. They can go on my website. I have those listed. Or they can go to uh, the state website, and they'll be able to find the exact dates and the protocols for calling in. But they can check my website. Uh, I have that information. Just a, a one final point on state finances. The mid-mark figures for receipts for the month of April are not obviously encouraging. They're, they're quite uh, quite concerning. We're going to wait and see what happens at the end of April in conversations with the Ways and Means Chair today on the Senate side anyway, Senator Timothy and myself. Um, the, we expect to be updated again next week once we get the full receipts in for the month of April. But still the prediction or the estimation is about a 500 to $700 million shortfall in the current fiscal year, that's subject to change. And then going into next fiscal year, and this doesn't count issues relative to when people will be able to file their taxes, which will now be in July, um, that the estimates next year, there's a range, but the middle number appears to be about a $5 billion shortfall in the budget for next year. And procedurally, and I know this is of concern to the mayor and to, to the council, um, as to when you get figures relative to, to local aid, um, in our conversations with the Ways and Means Chair today, they're not quite there yet in being able to offer any guidance as to what those, those amounts may be. So that's, I know, a quick update. Um, tragically, we're, we're over 3,000 deaths here in the Commonwealth now. I think we're at 3,153, which is up about 150 from yesterday. So we are, are still seeing those very high numbers. Uh, the Hospital bed capacity is such that we are able to accommodate those. There's over a thousand in ICU beds now, but we do have additional capacity within our healthcare system uh, to to meet the demand for those seeking medical attention. Thank you, Senator Keenan. Representative Cusack, <clears throat> add anything? Uh, thank you, um, and just to echo some of what John talked about. I'm not going to repeat uh, all that, but. Uh, since we last talked, I believe two weeks ago, uh, a couple pieces of legislation uh, that are now law. Uh, rent and foreclosure bill so that uh, during the state of emergency, uh, really halting all foreclosures and evictions. Uh, we've also done a, uh, a, a 
electronic notarization bills so notaries can uh, still perform their important legal functions, but do so electronically. Um, and we're working through all this. And one of the things we're finally feel we have a solution to is how we can meet as the house uh, in a formal session. Uh, and our first session is on Thursday. Uh, and that will be done by eight different conference call lines, 160 members on the phone uh, in order to pass some bonding uh, to cover us. Uh, they're called uh, revenue anticipation notes, uh, moving the tax deadline to July 15th to mirror what the feds did. Uh, the feds could do that easily because their fiscal year starts October 1st with ours being July 1st. Uh, we need to short term borrow uh, in order to make sure we have enough cash to carry us through the close of the fiscal year and into the new year. Uh, and that's probably going to be about a $3 billion borrowing. Um, but that's what we'll be doing uh, this Thursday in our first formal session since uh, the start of this crisis. Uh, and then going forward from that, uh, the next big thing in a normal year, um, this would be day two of our four day budget process up in the House of Representatives. Uh, that obviously is pushed off. Um, we're going to be looking at doing 112th budgeting uh, for each month uh, until we get a good grasp of what the actual numbers are here. And as John said, the midpoint number for uh, 5 billion, um, you know, being chair of revenue, talking with the chair of ways and means on our side in the House. Uh, we're basically using a range of four to six billion dollars in lost revenue. Uh, and it's significant in the number alone, but also when you look at the budget and so much of the budget is mandated spending, uh, how do you make that up? And it really is a discretionary spending in roughly about you know 20 percent of our normal revenue gone uh, in order to budget. Um, the big X factor in how we're going to mitigate this is really the feds. Uh, and the money coming in from the federal government. Um, we've received, you know, about a billion dollars for healthcare services, about 800 million for transportation. Um, but some good news on that front is the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has conceded that the next package will include uh, aid for cities and towns and the states. Uh, so hopefully we can fill the hole as much as possible. Uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, we're fortunate to have one of the largest reserves of any state in the country. We have three and a half billion dollars in our rainy day fund, uh, which will help us mitigate some of this loss while also meeting our obligations, such as the pension payments and bond payments. Um, so going forward, working through all that, um, we're hoping, but it remains to be unseen, um, the impact to us, what deficit we're going to have, and hopefully mitigate that as, you know, much as possible to have as little impact on the cities and towns. Um, but just to be cognizant of it, unrestricted local aid to Braintree is about six and a half million dollars. That's funded from the lottery. They're obviously seeing a significant loss in revenue. Uh, and then a new education bill, roughly $200 million in new spending this year. Uh, really taking a critical look at that if we can meet that obligation. Uh, and I know Mayor Kors and his team uh, we'll be rolling out their budget soon. Um, and they've done a good job with being conservative in their estimates. Uh, and we'll continue to work closely uh, with them and all of you as we get through this, especially with the, the financial impact and uh, hopefully not see um, the real deep cuts we saw back in 08, 09 uh, with the last recession. Uh, thank you, Representative Cusack. I uh, Senator Tilde is here, but I just want to, where you brought up the budget, I know in talking to the mayors, he is being very conservative in, in his approach. I was originally concerned with that, but it, it, pulling back on the revenues and all that. Representative Cusack, you mentioned a 112 budget. So the Senate and the House have spoken to all of our state legislators, may go to a 112 budget. If you both do decide to do that, it may not impact us, and correct me if I'm wrong here, unless the feds come in and a in, you give an influx to the local aid. Is that correct? Yeah, a combination of seeing what we're going to get in totality from the federal government. Uh, the past two aid packages so far, the first one, uh, we did see direct money into the state. The second one they just passed was uh, replenishing uh, the small business uh, loan and grant programs. Um, but the third one, we are hopeful, um, especially, like I said, the comments from the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, that the next package will focus uh, and have more direct payments 
uh, the cities and towns and the states uh, to help us fill this, you know, four to six billion dollars in lost revenue. Uh, and then, you know, our backstop is, you know, the three and a half billion dollars in reserves um, at the state level um, versus the town level. Um, you know, we gave the option in the municipal relief bill we talked about last meeting about giving the cities and towns the ability to do one twelfth budgeting or go for a full year budget. Um, cities and towns, you know, your funding sources mainly being property taxes, uh, are pretty solid compared to the loss in revenue we're experiencing at the state. Um, from all the different sources we see it from, uh, primarily corporate and uh, personal income. Uh, but that being said, uh, you know, we won't know this for months. And so we do, we will be using 112 budgeting. Um, there's no way we're going to have a budget back and forth. And probably by July 1st, we're adopting an order tomorrow in session uh, to move that uh, under the current <clears throat> large. The House is supposed to have a budget by the third week in May to the Senate. That's not going to happen. Uh, but in years past, we've used 112 budgeting when we do not come to agreement by the end of the fiscal year. Um, so it's a common tool we use at the state versus cities and towns. But given the flexibility uh, in, in Braintree, we're lucky with a town council form of government that you can act on the budget. Um, other towns, I represent Holbrook, um, they're in a different place because they can't get a town meeting together. Um, you know, especially in cities and towns, it's one thing if you have a representative town meeting and you know who your elected town meetings are, but in most cities and towns that have open town meeting where any citizen uh, can participate, it is impossible to using technology without disenfranchising someone. Uh, so they're in a different place and that's why the option of 112 budgeting uh, to help cities and towns, uh, you know, mitigate through this and then see where the revenues are as they go forward with a full budget. Thank you, Representative um, Cusack. Senator Tilty, thank you for well, joining us. Do you want to add anything on the COVID? And the I, I, absolutely, I absolutely wouldn't. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President, and to the mayor and all the members of the council, and to uh, Rep Cusack and Senator Keenan, who just gave a very able summation. Uh, I caution as far as uh, the stabilization fund. Uh, it is uh, $3.5 billion, of course, and it is one of the largest in the union. Uh, we cannot use all of it in the next year, fiscal year, uh, to come in the remainder of this one, because uh, obviously the high stabilization fund, the robust stabilization fund that we currently enjoy allows us to borrow money at a cheaper rate because we enjoy, of course, a high bond rating. So we do have uh, ample, in terms of reserves, ample reserves, but we must uh, be conservative in our use of it. Of course, it is set aside for a situation such as this. Uh, not that any of us could have seen a global pandemic, but we do have to be cautious in terms of our implementation of it in the next year, a year and a half. Uh, also, uh, next week, the Senate will be meeting. Uh, we've uh, worked out in caucus today, a Democratic caucus in terms of parameters for so safe social distancing and uh, meeting of the members with several different options, but we will be meeting uh, to work on the short-term borrowing, which of course is necessary because of the uh, delayed revenue tax payments to July 15th. And uh, I must say, I, I salute each and every person in the town of Braintree for stepping up in the town government for its leadership in this crisis of COVID-19. Thank you, Senator. Uh, is it too early to talk about the third municipal relief package? Did that just come out today? Are being talked about today. I, yeah, I it was, our representative. It was finally talked about today, but you know, it's at the federal level. Uh, Congressman Neal uh, out of Springfield, who's also the Ways and Means Chairman in the House of Representatives, also acknowledged that they are already working on a third package, but details are sparse. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Course, Any other, if I may, Senator yep. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam President. Of course, uh, as Rep. Cusack and Senator Keenan uh, will. Uh, attest to uh, we're of course working on our third municipal relief package and uh, that should be uh, I believe worked on next week at some point okay working on now but in terms of uh, you know votes within what? Yes. Um, any other counselors have questions for anybody in the mayor's office who are of state legislatures on the COVID-19 Council President. Flaherty. Sorry. Oh, and then I'll get to you, Mayor. Council Flaherty. 
Uh, well, I just, I'd like to return to the issue of the compressor station, if we could, because um, I know that the construction site is in Weymouth, um, but there's evidence that the, the workers come from numerous locations out of state. And it seems that a good number of them are staying in Braintree, um, in Braintree long-term stay establishments. Now, I know that Braintree has taken steps to enforce orders relevant to supermarkets, like to reduce the spread of COVID-19 by keeping the number of customers down in each in each store. Um, the reports coming out of FRAX, the FRAX organization, is that some of the workers coming from out of state aren't observing the governor's orders about two week uh, long um, quarantine periods before working. And my question really is, what would Braintree need? What what information would Braintree need before an investigation into the adherence to those uh, restrictions would be warranted? Madam, Madam Chairman, may I speak? Who is it? So the, the advisory... Wait, you the, speaking. Is that Mary, Mary Beth? Yes. Okay, Director Mary Beth McGrath, go ahead. Just because we can't, I can't see you and for the people listening, just if when you do speak, just state your name if I haven't done so already. Sure, this is Mary Beth McGrath, Director of Building and Health Division. With re regard to the response to Councilor Flaherty, the directive that was issued by the governor is an advisory to quarantine. It is not an order. So the town would, I mean, certainly there may be people staying at our hotels that could be working at the compressor station. But again, as it being an advisory, we cannot insist that they self quarantine for two weeks it, as it is an advisory, not an order. Okay. Does that answer your question, Councilor Flaherty? Mayor Kukoris, did you want to add something? Yes, uh, I just wanted to also talk about um, some, you know, we're talking about the budget, um, the 2020 budget, and we're looking at um, our numbers. We have worked um, worked with each and every department head through um, Chief, of, Chief of Staff, Nicole Taub, and uh, Karen Shanley, who is our HR director. And they were able to uh, put together a reduction in hours uh, for nearly 60 employees for this particular fiscal 2020 budget that we're in uh, to try to uh, do some cost savings. So we're looking, you know, we're definitely looking at every option possible during this 2020 budget uh, to try to minimize uh, the impact um, of lost revenues. So that's something that we have, um, put into place and it started on Monday and we're going to review it every two weeks, but I just wanted you to be, you all to be aware of the fact that um, we have uh, put together a plan to do some cost savings through reduction in hours. Um, the individuals that are affected um, range in different positions uh, throughout the town. Uh, they do not lose uh, health insurance benefits. They do not lose uh, time towards retirement, et cetera. Um, so this is just one way for us to uh, work to minimize uh, the damage economically caused by um, the coronavirus. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Kukoros. Any other council have a question for the mayor's office or our state legislatures? Seeing none, okay. Uh, the state legislatures, are, you are more than welcome to stay along with us because the mayor is going to be presenting his budget. Um, if not, we thank you very much and hopefully we will uh, be back, well, no, actually with a new order today. So our next Zoom meeting, hopefully you'll be able to join us as well, as, as well. but I thank you again for all your hard work on behalf of the VIA residents uh, for Braintree and for the constant communication. I know I've spoken to all three of you and I'm sure other councils as well. Uh, but thank you so much for your willingness to work so closely with us and I know the mayor's office in getting through this pandemic. It is greatly appreciated to you and all your staff. I know I've spoken to some of your staff members too. So thank you, uh, extend the thanks to them, to you and their your um, staff members on their hard work and to Mayor Kokoros, to uh, you and all your staff. These are unprecedented times and everybody is working night and day and through the weekend. So it, it does not go unnoticed. It is uh, unprecedented as the mayor and I were in a Braintree Chamber meeting yesterday. We are all in this together. So it does, uh, this is more than ever, it takes, you know, 
everybody on board to get through this. So I can't extend the appreciation and thanks to all, everybody here in attendance, the residents as well. So um, thank you. Okay, thank we you. are moving on to 01920, the mayor, the F FY 2021 budget submission. I will turn it back over to you, Mayor Kokoros. Thank you. Good evening, President Hume, members of the council and residents of the town of Braintree. Thank you for the opportunity to present my first budget of fiscal year 2021 to you this evening. Before I speak on the budget, I wanna take a moment to recognize Health Director Mary Beth McGrath, Public Nurses Jean McGinty and Mary Mulready, the Nurses Brigade from the Braintree Public Schools, Chief of Staff Nicole Taub, Police Chief Mark DuBois, Fire Chief Jim O'Brien, Superintendent Dr. Frank Hackett, Services Coordinator Kate Norton, and Assistant to the Mayor Steve Leary. During these extraordinary times, my team has worked tirelessly to help fight the coronavirus pandemic within our community. While still performing their day-to-day -day duties necessary to keep our town operating and providing the necessary services for the residents of Braintree. I cannot say enough about the time and effort that they have put into making sure every town employee and Braintree resident have updated information available on a daily basis why, while implement, implementing measures to keep everyone safe and healthy. My team has gone above and beyond their day-to-day -day responsibilities and have shown me their incredible commitment to the town and our residents. For that, I wanna say thank you to each and every one of them. Together we have faced this difficult time marred by uncertainty in so many ways. Our children's classrooms moved into our living rooms with parents and school administrators working together to continue the great education system in our community. Employees have set up home offices with meetings like this one being held online. The economy has taken its most devastating blow since the Great Depression, with reopening dates unknown and innovative measures being implemented to allow for essential businesses to operate. This may be the greatest challenge that we face as a community in our lifetime, but our resolve will not be broken and together we will come out of this pandemic stronger than ever. As most of you know, the legislature gave cities and towns the option to postpone the creation of the complete fiscal year 2021 budget. However, as part of my commitment to transparency and keeping our government operating, I feel it is important to present this balanced budget in a timely manner. Despite the hardships facing, currently facing the town, the Commonwealth and the nation. We as leaders must stand strong and formulate budgets to provide and maintain services to our residents. It is my responsibility to provide the town council with a balanced budget for fiscal year 2021. Through many hours, days and months of hard work by my staff and all our department heads, the fiscal year 2021 budget totaling $143,370,197 is presented to you tonight. The 2021 budget represents an increase of 2.84% overall from fiscal year 2020 budget, which is the smallest overall projected increase in the town budget over the past several years. The 2021 budget presented to you tonight continues to provide the level of services that our residents expect and deserve. We are all aware of the uncertainty of the duration of this pandemic, as well as its potential long-term financial impacts. During the creation of the 2021 budget, we took into consideration these future fiscal uncertainties in formulating our projections for the year. In January, the governor released his 2021 state budget. 
We have taken into consideration the loss of revenue due to mandated business closures and other potential changes to revenue to fund the proposed budget. As you will see in our 2021 operational budget, we have made adjustments to accommodate potential reductions in state aid. In addition, we have reduced our projected revenue from the hotel motel tax by 50% and reduced our meals tax projection by 25%. Additionally, we have reduced our interest income projection by 75% for fiscal year 2021. As well as reducing revenue projections for 2021, my team and I have worked with all the department heads to reduce budgets by as much as 4% for each department. Our department heads have done an incredible job to maintain the highest level of services for our residents while finding ways to reduce their fiscal 2021 budgets. Even with these reductions in the budget, we still maintain our high level of ser services in workforce. Based on this fiscally conservative approach, I am confident in the budget presented to you this evening. I would like to highlight some items within the budget. The budget fully supports the needs of the Braintree Public Schools, including plans to move fifth graders to the newly renovated East Middle School and staffing needs that correspond with this change. We will continue to provide the highest quality of education for our students. Through the Department of Municipal Licensing and Inspections, we will continue to support important missions of the Braintree Community Partnership on Substance Use and the Commission on Disabilities. Our police and fire departments will continue providing important public safety services to our residents. As you will see, both departments have received additional funding to cover overtime costs. And, will, and with continued oversight and management by our public safety leaders, we will move to reduce and eventually eliminate a supplemental appropriation request to cover these costs. The Department of Elder Affairs will continue its support of our senior population with various social events throughout the year and a newsletter to keep residents informed of all the great activities available to them. The Thayer Public Library in collaboration with the library trustees continues to enhance its services even while its doors have been closed to the public. Most recently, our library staff provided virtual book and cookbook clubs, and a murder mystery to keep residents engaged from their living rooms. I am committed to funding a master plan, and under the management of our planning and community development department, we will undertake this endeavor in the fiscal year 2021 to help guide the future of our community. We have a very strong Department of Public Works. All of our divisions will continue to provide all the services necessary to the community. In addition, for the first time, we are designating a specific line item under recreation and community events to help fund improvements to our parks and fields. Also, our facilities team will continue their great work in maintaining and upgrading our buildings throughout town. Also, at the February 25th, 2020, meeting, the council refer referred the town's fiscal year 2020 capital to committee for review. As with the budge, budget proposal, <clears throat> I worked closely with department heads, prioritizing their capital request with an eye towards enhancing our buildings, such as the renovation of the fire headquarters, continued road pavement and infrastructure projects, some capital items our plan includes are as follows. Finally, the expansion and repaving the parking lot at the Department of Elder Affairs to not only improve access to the facility, but to provide adequate parking as well. Funding to provide renovation to fire headquarters. 
enhanced ADA accessibility throughout town, update our records management system and computer aided dispatch at, at the police department, as well as replacement of cruisers. And lastly, funding $1 million, once again, in capital improvements for our school department. You will be receiving a detailed summary of the capital plan later this week. In, addi in addition, later this evening, you'll be referring the final supplemental requests for the fiscal year 2020 budget, which includes expenses related to police and fire overtime, as well as other unanticipated costs incurred this year. My staff and I will continue to find ways to minimize these costs in the future. This budget represents the fiscal strength of our town. And I ask you to approve the fiscal year 2021 budget as submitted. It shows our ability to make adjustments and the ability of our department heads to come together for the greater good of our town, its employees, and most importantly, you, the residents. We are a community of strength, resilience, and compassion, as proven once again by the generosity and kindness shown by so many during one of our darkest hours. As your mayor, I am truly grateful for the ability to lead such a wonderful community. And I know that we will continue to build a better Braintree together. And I thank you for your time, Madam President and Town Council. And I wish you uh, good health. And I hope that uh, the budget process uh, goes uh, well for you. And I thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to do the introduction tonight. Oh, thank you, Mayor Kokoros. I know under um, normal circumstances, the budget is no easy task and department heads start this well back into the early part of the fall. Um, and now given this COVID-19, your whole um, staff had to readjust and re-examine under a small window of time. And that's no easy task. Uh, I think you are conservative in your approach with the revenues and um, I look forward to that, but just for the public watching and listening at home, our Committee on Ways and Means will be taking up the budget presented to us by Mayor Kokoros this evening, beginning next week. Uh, they will be televised via Zoom meetings and they begin on May 5th, May 6th, 7th, 11th, 13th, 18th, and 19th. If additional time is needed, we will add to it as well, but our um, also in attendance tonight are our, our internal auditors, that's the town council internal auditors, Dan Sullivan and Sean McGoldrick with Clifton Larson Allen. They will be working closely with the Ways and Means Committee uh, headed by uh, Chairwoman uh, Council Berica. So um, you can all tune into that and where they will take a thorough and in-depth look at the um, mayor's budget and be meeting with various department heads each night along with the uh, Interim Chief of Staff, Nicole Taub, and Director Ed Spellman, will all be working collaboratively together to review that. So again, thank you for that. Um, if, it, if I could, uh, I just yeah, wanted to, thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to say thank you. And just uh, normally we're in, a, in the council chambers and uh, you know, there's, there's a visual of, of all the staff and I just wanted uh, to just, uh, let you know and, and thank all, all of uh, the department heads that are here tonight, uh, virtually. Um, Shamela uh, Biswa um, is here. She is from Elder Services. Uh, Lorraine C, who does all of our um, contracts, et cetera. Karen Shanley, our HR director. And Mary Beth McGrath, as you all know. Um, Christine Stickney from Planning. Ed Spellman, our finance director, Dr. Frank Hackett, the superintendent of schools, DPW director, Jim Arsenault, Chief of Staff, Nicole Taub, Chief Mark Du Bois, our police chief, Chief O'Brien, our fire chief, and I believe Terry Stano is here from the library, and Bill Batigi uh, from Br Brantree Electric Light. And I just wanna say thank you to all of them for all the hard work that they've put into this budget. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mayor Kikoros. Any members of the council wish to comment? With that, we're not gonna get into questions tonight because the budget's gonna be presented to Ways and Means next week. So any comments on council, uh, <laughs> Mayor Kikoros' <laughs> presentation of the budget this evening? Anybody? Okay, seeing none. All right, thank you again, Mayor Kikoros. We will be moving on with our budget. Um, Okay, moving on to old business, item 20.0.018, the Comcast position for 262 Forbes Road, or take up any action relative there too. I will refer to the Chairman of the Committee of Public Works, Councilor Ryan, for an update. Thank you. Um, the Department of Public Works uh, subcommittee met for this petition and unanimously recommends favorable action to the full council for this uh, petition. Okay, uh, does Council Ryan, is this any, does our uh, Comcast rep need to speak on this or I'll defer to you to call on him, how's that? I, I don't believe they need to speak. Okay. Um, they understand uh, we went through all of the town staff recommendations regarding this permit. There are no conflicts. Uh, the um, the roadway is not under moratorium, so it was unanimously recommended for this to be approved. Okay, thank you. Uh, Council Ringus, do you have a motion? There you go. I do. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I would move that we service 262 Forbes Road, installing and maintaining approximately 482 feet of communication cable in one to four inch PVC concrete and case conduit 24 inches deep from an existing vault across from number 222 Forbes Road to a new three by three manhole at the driveway into 262 Forbes Road with staff recommendation. Belled will be a seeing an attached underground utilities map contracted to follow dig safe procedures. Comcast to notify Belled of any utility conflicts or scope of work changes. Uh, DPW, this section of Forbes Road is not being under moratorium. DPDW recommending that the permit be granted with the normal conditions imposed by the DPW Highway Division plus that one Forbes Road was not built under the town supervision and so the presence and locations of drainage pipes and other utilities are not definitively known. Visible evidence reveals the presence of water lines and drainage system within the scope of this proposed work. Care being taken to support and not damage existing utilities and a plan of the details of the conduit system installed as built shall be submitted to the DPW engineering division and shall include sizes, materials, and locations of all utilities encountered during the construction. Two, if sidewalk surfaces are disturbed, the surfaces be placed in kind at ADA compliant slopes and for the full width of the sidewalk and including fully ADA compliant curb, cut, curb ramps where required. Three, the traffic management plan sheets shall reference the 2009 MUTCD rather than the 2003 edition as noted. Also, the advanced warning signs on the northeast bound approach must be extended further southwest due to the serious sight line constraint posed by the vertical curve in the roadway. Four, the required trench repairs to have the trench width temporary paved with two three inch force of binder and then for the permanent repair mill off the first one and a half inches depth of the trench width plus one foot on each side, then clean tack and repave the trench with one and a half inches of top. Five, the drawing refers to plates if they are to be used as in curing the concrete encasement. It should be for not more than one overnight with asphalt ramps at all edges in the traffic area and signs warning of their presence. All matches existing surfaces be smooth, safe, properly surfaced, and satisfactory to the town. Seven, the conduit shall be installed outside of the trenches of the water, sewer, and drain lines and other utilities in service, and that the trench pavement not be left low for any length of time. Eight, DPW shall be notified when the construction conflicts with town utilities, so the resolution can be mutually agreeable. Nine, the construction portion of the permit shall exceed not two months from the start of construction, and the entire permit shall be set at one year beginning at the date of council approval. Uh, furthermore, recommending the following requirement be added. 
uh, neither Comcast nor any of its contractors is authorized to close any street or to close the direction of travel to facilitate their work without authorization from the Director of Public Works or the Highway Superintendent. The Chief of Police can also authorize a closure for a police or fire emergency. Construction zone traffic safety issues are to be addressed by using appropriate traffic control signs and devices and the use of police offices for traffic control to safely guide traffic through the work zone. If a closure is authorized by the DPW, it shall not be implemented until signs and police offices where needed are properly in place in conformity with the written plan prepared by the contractor's engineer and approved by the DPW and police department. Second. It's been made by uh, Councillor Ringus, seconded by Councillor Ryan. All those in favor by a roll call vote, please, Clerk Samino. Uh, Councillor Ryan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I think that for the remainder motions we have to vote on, if uh, Councillor Ringus makes the main motion, I think it would be appropriate to say with staff recommendations because he's just going to be repeating all those recommendations. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Okay, Clerk Samino, roll call vote, please. Councillor Barica. Yes. Councillor Connors. Yes. Councillor Flaherty. Hold on. Go ahead. Councillor Flaherty. Thank you. Councillor Hume. Aye. Councillor Mackin. Aye. Councillor O'Brien. Yay. Councillor Ringus. Aye. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Councillor Sasha. Yes. All in favor. Okay, thank you, Nigel. That is unanimous. Moving on to item 20023, National Grid Petition, Liberty Street, or take up any action relative thereto. I will refer to the Chairman of the Committee on Public Works, Councillor Ryan, for an update. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The Department of Public Works subcommittee met and voted unanimously to recommend favorable action to the full council for this petition. Uh, this roadway is not under moratorium and uh, some of the work taking place close by, the streets are going to be redone. So we want uh, National Grid to get in there and do their work now so they get it over with and then we do the streets over. So this is a very good schedule for us and we recommend favorable action to the full council. Uh, thank you, Councilor Ryan. Uh, and for those new to the moratorium was brought forward which there was information in the packet because of you Councilor ryan years ago to preserve all the money that was put into our streets to, using chapter 90 funding through the state so thank you again for all that work um and getting that done and keeping the work that we've done um looking great and and preserving the assets that we've done on our town um Councilor ringus for the motion please uh, thank you, Madam President. I would move that we install and maintain approximately 3,145 feet of 6 inch 60 PSI plastic gas main in Liberty Street from the existing 6 inch 60 PSI plastic service at 1024 Liberty Street to the existing 6 inch 60 PSI main at Christina Drive and including a 4 inch 60 PSI connection at Peach Street a three inch 60 PSIG connection at Forest Street and a two inch 60 PSIG connection plus test station in a nodes at Sycamore Road and also to install and maintain 1,420 feet of two inch 60 PSIG plastic gas main and Proctor Road, all to replace older mains and service the users along the route with staff, staff recommendations of Beld and DPW. Second. There's been a motion made by Council Ringus, seconded by Councilor Ryan. Any discussion? Seeing none, a roll call vote, please, Clerk Samino. Council Barricker raised her hand. Council oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Didn't see that. No Council Barricker. Thank you, no problem. Um, and I just had a quick question. I want to thank um, Director Arsenal for answering the questions I had before tonight's council meeting. And I don't know if we have someone here from National Grid. 
Um, this is a District 5 neighborhood, and I am wondering what additional steps either the DPW, whether it's through robocalls or postcards or something that we can just notify, or whether it's the National, National Grid Company, notify the residents of this upcoming work, um, especially this is a dense residential neighborhood right by Liberty School just to make sure people know what's happening and what's going on. So is there anything we can either compel National Grid to do um, or we can take steps to do? Normally National Grid does um, communicate with the residents and let them know what's going on and we'll make and sure they do that. Can you state your name for those listening? Sorry. Jim Arsenal, Director of uh, sorry, sorry about that. DPW. Um, so, sorry, uh, Jim. Jim. Oh, we do have a representative with National Grid. Mary Mulrooney's here. Yes. Okay, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, it's okay. I was just, um, to you, uh, Chairperson, I uh, just was mentioning that um, that normally we do make sure that they comply, but it, it would be good to hear it from them as well. So remind them, so. <laughs> uh, Mary Mulroney from National Grid, you are here. Do you want to comment on that? I will take your request back and um, let the managers and engineers know that that's your concerns. Okay, yeah, if we can get notes out or some communication to these residents, um, knowing these neighborhoods, we, we just need to make sure people know what's upcoming. It's an important critical infrastructure project, but let's make sure the residents aren't blindsided by lots of construction. Thank you, National Grid. Thank you. So, so Mary Mulroney and Jim Arsenal, this has been an issue in the past where residents haven't been notified. So if the two of you work together and just uh, loop the council in on the communication that has been done, that would be great. So the count district councilors can uh, get in touch with their constituents as well. Understood. Okay, you. Understood. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Council Flaherty for discussion on the motion on the table. Um, because this is planned to be so near Liberty School, is there a time when this work is set to be to be in, assuming that permission is given tonight? I'm worried because uh, I want to make sure that there's a plan in place for all the pedestrian traffic that the school generates at the beginning and end of school. There's a lot of kids in that pedestrian traffic, and a lot of a lot of them are unaccompanied. Many of them are accompanied by parents, but definitely not all of them. So. If you're going to do the work while school's not in session, it's not really an issue. But if you think that you might still be doing this work during the school year, do you have a plan yet about what you would do to make sure that pedestrian traffic is safe? I don't know the exact start date. I'm assuming that it would start um, sooner rather than later, given that the school is out of session right now, and try to have the work done probably by the end of um, August. Yep. Madam Chairperson, to you? Or? Yep. Director Arsenal, uh, go ahead. So yeah, normally I wouldn't say, you know, given the situation and the, the, what's going on, I would imagine they'd be moving on this quite quickly. They'd want to get this out of the way and moved out because we'd be doing work in the future and they, we want to, they want to make sure that's out of the way as much as we want, want them to. So I can't see it being delayed that long. And you know, there is a possibility given a lot of things are happening that we didn't expect, but um, I would imagine that would be done well before school start of school. Okay. In the and I just want to add to that. So in the event it does not, or any other project does go forward and take place during school, I know in the past when there have been projects right near schools and crossing yards, the work was halted for the hours you know, hour or so, hour and a half, whatever that may be, that students were going into school and then the hour or so after, and that was not an issue. So we can definitely work with, you know, uh, National Grid or whoever that may be, uh, if it does come up and become an issue in the future, because it has been done, something that has been done in the past on projects similar to this. Okay, okay any further questions? Seeing none, there's been a motion made by Councilor Ringus, seconded by Councilor Ryan. Clerk Semino, roll call please. Councilor Derrica? Yes. Councilor Connors? Yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Hume? Yeah, aye. Councilor Mackin? Aye. Councilor O'Brien? Yay. Councilor Ringus? Aye. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Councilor Sasha? 
Yes. There was nine in favor. Nine in favor. That is unanimous. Thank you, Clerk Samino. Moving on to item 20024, National Grid Petition, the Stonewood Lane, or take up any action relative thereto. Um, this has been withdrawn. I will refer to Councillor Chairperson of the Department of Public Works, Councillor Ryan. You're stealing my thunder, madam. Sorry, I got ahead of myself. <laughs> so, um, 2024 National Grid Petition, Stonewood Lane and 2025 National Grid Petition, Why Not Road, uh, have been withdrawn. Both of these petitions were proposed on streets that were under moratorium. So uh, National Grid has withdrawn both petitions and no further action is required by this body tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. So with that, we will be moving on to item 200026, National Grid Petition, Elm Street, or take up any the action relative there too, and I will refer to the chair, men of committee and public works, Councilor Ryan. Thank you. Um, the subcommittee on the Department of Public Works met and uh, voted tonight. To, I voted for tonight's uh, recommendation for favorable action to the full council. That was unanimous. There is no conflict and no moratorium um, regarding this petition. So, favorable action, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Ryan. Councillor Ringus for the motion. Uh, Madam President, I would move under 20026 that we install and maintain approximately 1,465 feet of 8 inch 60 PSIG plastic gas main in Elm Street from the existing 1 inch plastic service at Service Road to the existing 6 inch 60 PSIG main at Middle Street and including an 8 inch 60 PSIG connection at Church Street and 2 inch 60 PSIG connections at Vinton Ave, Elm Terrace, Lowell Street and Cedar Street and also to install and maintain 490 feet of 2 inch 60 PSIG plastic gas main in Charles Street all to replace older mains and service the users along the route with staff recommendations. Second. There's been a motion made by Council Ringus, seconded by Councilor Ryan. Any discussion? Seeing none, oh, Councilor Shasha. Oh. I, uh, I just wanted to um, echo the comments made about Liberty Street. This is typically one of the worst intersections in town. So if people could be notified, that'd be great. And the other thing is that um, because it's such an, a, a busy intersection, the sooner that this one could be done, probably the better while traffic is so much lighter than it is normally. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Anybody else? Okay, Clark Simino, roll call, please. Councilor Barica. Yes. Councilor Connors. Yes. Councilor Flaherty. Councillor Flaherty? Yes. Councillor Hume? Aye. Councillor Mackin? Aye. Councillor O'Brien? Yay. Councillor Ringus? Aye. Councillor Ryan? Aye. Councillor Sasha? Yes. Nine in favor. That is unanimous. Thank you, Clark Samino. Moving on to item 20032, the Mayor FY 2020 Supplemental Appropriation. Number two, the master plan, or take up any action relative thereto. This is a public hearing. Is there a motion to take off the table order 20032? So moved, Madam President. Second. There's been a motion made by Councilor Ringus, seconded by Councilor Ryan. Clerk Samino, a roll call, please. Councilor Barica? Yes. Councilor Connors? Yes. Councilor Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Hume? Aye. Councilor Mackin? Uh, yes, for discussion. This this is just uh, to take off the table? Uh, can, can I have a question? Maybe go into a public hearing, Councilor Mackin, on it. OK, uh, yes. Thank you. Councilor O'Brien? Yay. Councilor Ringus? Aye. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Councilor Sasha? Yes. Nine in favor. I know that is unanimous. It has been taken off the table. So now, is there a motion to open the public hearing? So moved, Madam President. Second. There's been a motion made by Councilor Ringus, seconded by Councilor Ryan. 
Roll call vote to open the public hearing, Clark Sabino. Councilor Barica. Yes. Councilor Connors. Yes. Councilor Flaherty. Yes. Councilor Hume. Aye. Councilor Mackin. Yep. Councilor O'Brien. Yay. Councilor Ringus. Aye. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Councilor Sasha. Yes. Nine in favor. Okay, we are open the public hearing on item 20032, the supplemental appropriation for on the master plan. For anybody in attendance, those are the attendees, not the panel, not the council. If you wish to speak in the public hearing and you are on a telephone, text if you are on a cell phone to our clerk, Sue Samino, this number, 339-987-2726. Let her know that you would like to speak and we will call on you. If you are in attendance and you are through any type of the video, I will see you raise your hand and when it's time to go to the public, we will go over to you and I will call on you. I do know Jill Coyle is one to speak. So Jill, when we are ready, I will call on you. I do see there's two other numbers. If you do wish to speak, again, call that number 339-987-2726. Uh, and just wanna remind everybody tonight, we are voting on the funding of the master plan. There's some um, appropriation of money. It's the funding that is before us here tonight. Uh, further discussion, comments, public hearings, whatnot. We've been given so much information uh, on the mayor's office. I appreciate all the work the mayor's office has done on this. Uh, this was one of your campaign platforms as well as many counselors. I do know this is a priority, um, so I appreciate that. So with that, do we want to start with the mayor's office? Is anybody prepared to speak from your office on this? Um, I could speak if, if you if you uh, would like, Madam President. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you. I first of all, I'm asking uh, for support uh, for this transfer of funds to um, fund this master plan. Uh, there were some questions uh, in regards to uh, the process, and the process um, initially is the first phase is public. Uh, input and there is a committee of nine members that will be set up. We have looked at um, what would be the best way to set it up so that we have a group that represents the residents as best we can. Uh, so there will be five residents of the nine members. Uh, there will be a member for, from the town council, which um, the council president would appoint a member of the planning board and two members from the business community. Um, it would be one small business owner and one um, business, a larger type business. Uh, the goal is to have this committee um, basically put together um, meetings and kind of define um, how they want to go out and collect information from the public. My vision is that they would uh, meet with civic organizations. Uh, they would also um, meet in each district, um, as I was able to do, go around and put together a, a, a meeting within each district with district counselors. So I think that would be another um, idea that I'd like to see uh, take place. We have uh, we have our squares, uh, Braintree Square, South Braintree Square, the landing. They all have uh, unique situations and issues. Um, so I think that the goal is the collection of all, this, all of this information and um, to have as much public input. And by the way, I don't think there should be three o'clock Monday afternoon meetings. I think there should be night meetings so that the public can attend and um, the residents that are part of the committee, et cetera, can be there. So uh, I want this to be set up for success and I want it to be um, reflective of the residents of the community and how they vision the town of Braintree to be in the future. So I just wanted to clarify that. I've had some conversations with uh, Councilor Sasha about some of the wording in the memo that came out today we removed 
uh, the wording on the committee. It was one uh, section. And uh, I most certainly want uh, to have the best committee put together the, the greatest amount of information so that we have um, a very complete visioning before we go ahead and start to put together uh, this master plan. Thank you for uh, letting me speak, Madam President. Thank you, Mayor Kokoros, and I do have to apologize. I should have referred to the Chairwoman of Ways and Means, Council Berica, first for a recommendation of Ways and Means, so my apologies, Council Berica. <laughs> Not at all, no problem. Um, thank you, Madam President. The Ways and Means Committee met last week after this motion was sent back to that committee. Um, and as requested, the mayor's office provided answers to all of the questions that were submitted. So thank you for that. Um, and for the public's knowledge, uh, the questions and answers that I'm referring to can be found on the town's website in the town council agenda section. So it's all part of tonight's uh, documents. Based on those questions and our discussion, um, as Mayor Kokoros just noted, it is clear that creating a new master plan for Braintree is a priority. We discussed that as important as the plan itself will be citizen involvement in every step of this process, along with transparent, clear, and regular communication about the plan, as the mayor himself has just indicated. Um, additionally, I would like to report back to this full council that my financial concerns were alleviated after having spoken to the town auditor and being assured that the requested funding will not overly burden our free cash balance, even in the current environment. So with all that said, the Ways and Means Committee is again sending this to the full council with a favorable recommendation of four in favor and one opposed. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Council Barica. Councilor Connors. Okay. So I just have one question. Why did, why was the wording removed about pe people being able to come in and observe the meetings for the steering committee? I Council, I mean, may I <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Old habits die hard. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all right. No worries. No worries. Um, uh, Basically, we were trying to make, we, the goal was to make sure that the public had an opportunity to speak. And we wanted the committee to be able to kind of form their own rules. So for example, if the committee wanted to deliberate on something and have discussion and maybe digest some information on a particular night, uh, it might be difficult to do that if you have a public uh, hearing, a public meeting and uh, a number of members of the public come and want to talk about things when you're trying to dissect, let's say, um, a meeting you had on a particular uh, part of town. So the goal was to um, allow the committee to make those decisions, but the intent, or my intent at least uh, through this process has been to make sure that there is public input, but I didn't want to tied the um, group to any particular rules. So we try to leave it as open as possible. Well, at this point, it's com completely open so that um, if, they, if the committee does have a meeting and they want the public to give input, or they have a meeting and they want to be able to deliberate on some of that input, they can pretty much um, be able to do that. So that was part of the reason why it was removed. Not for any reason other than uh, to leave it up to the committee to uh, be able to be more flexible. And so will there be invites for people to attend the meetings? Not so much for input, but um, what this particularly said was to attend meetings and observe. So will people still be allowed to go in and observe or will it be private? I would say at this point that it's up to the committee how they want to handle it, but I, I, would, I would hope that every meeting and I, I will say I would insist that every meeting would at least have folks there to, to be, be able to observe uh, and participate when uh, we're looking for, when they're looking for input. Um, and I will say this, that um, as they uh, form the committee, we will make sure that we use all of the means that we have, that the enhanced communication that we have right now um, to post the meetings on Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, we also have um, a newsletter 
uh, with over 2,000 emails, we can, so we have an enhanced uh, method of communicating with the public outside of your traditional uh, news media. And, um, you know, part of it is because of our communication uh, in regard to um, the coronavirus and how many people have signed up. So we have uh, the ability to get the message out and I will have uh, my assistant, uh, Steve Larry, uh, or services coordinator, Kate Naughton, work with the committee to make sure that if they're having a particular meeting, let's just say in your district and you wanted to get the word out, we'll do whatever we need to do to make sure that we do that for you uh, to get as much public uh, input. Right. The only concern I had was that when you took it out, it made it look like there were going to just be private meetings and people were not going to be allowed to come in and observe and be part of the process. I, I will make you the pro I will promise you that it will be an open uh, meeting for all public to come uh, and comment for sure. Okay. All right. Okay. That's all Council you had your hand up. Uh, yes. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I, I realize this is about the primary about the funding, which I will be voting to approve. Um, but I like to ask a question to start, and this is related to some of the questions other councils asked in an email from Clerk Samino this morning. And this question um, was related to about the final approval of the master plan, um, whether it would go to the town council and the response that was written to us was no, because um, in a set specified by statute, it goes to the planning board. So I was gonna ask uh, which statute, and I may have a follow-up based on the answer to that. Um, well, can I, can I just answer the question? Um, yeah. Madam President. Yeah, of course. Um, not, thank you, Madam President. I will say that, you know, we had discussion about this as well. Um, the committee, I, I believe that the committee will be giving updates through the council representation on a regular basis as to some of the topics that were discussed, et cetera. So there should be ongoing communication, but there is no reason whatsoever why the council can't have a presentation. Um, whether it's through legal statute or not, I, I don't have a problem with um, the committee going to the council to present it to the council and have the council uh, approve it or disapprove it. Uh, I think that in the end, you now the council um, is gonna be part of any changes we make if there are any zoning changes. Uh, so I think it's important that you are involved. So it's not, um, it's not something that I, I would, I think that should be prohibited. I think that um, whether it has legal authority or not is irrelevant. I think just the fact that um, bringing that information to the council and doing the presentation when the final product is done is important so that the council has an opportunity to give its full input. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, but um, to just finish off the original question of what statute is it that says the planning board has the final adoption? I would refer it to, I'd refer to the solicitor. Yep, go ahead. Thank you, Madam President, Mr. Mayor. I believe that that's, and I don't have it in front of me, Councillor Mack, and so for that I apologize, but I believe it's contained in Chapter 41, Section 81D that includes the elements of the master plan. Um, but like I said, I don't, because I have everybody here up on my screen. I, I don't have the ability to pull it up. Um, but as the mayor indicated, you know, the statutory, the statutory authority for adoption um, does vest with the planning board, but the intention would be, uh, as included in the scope of work for the consultant on this, would be periodic, and, and periodic means whatever we choose to define it to be, presentations to the council so that it remains informed, and we would also expect that the steering committee would engage in that same type of presentation so that uh, you continue to receive updates as the process moves forward uh, and not just one big presentation upon its completion. Uh, th thank you both. Appreciate it. All right, I'm going to go to Councillor Sasha and then Councillor O'Brien. Councillor Sasha, you just need to unmute. I can't do it for you. I don't know why. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I just wanted to point out that I, I was the no vote on ways and means, as I have continued to be, be because I had concerns about the public input process. Um, but I, I, I believe those those concerns are. Uh, alleviated at this point, and I just wanted to say thank you to Mayor Kokoros for um, taking the time out of everything going on to talk with me this weekend about 
what your intent was. And it is clear to me um, from speaking to you and from hearing you speak tonight that it is your intention to, um, to instruct the group, the steering committee, to conduct um, multiple multiple venues for public input throughout this process. And I, I think that is the one critical piece that will make this project a success. So thank you for, for doing that. And I, I will be in favor of this at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sasha. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. I would echo what the previous speaker, the two previous speakers ago talked about. It is in chapter 41, subsection 81D. And uh, I have reviewed documentation from the body that we are part of, which is the MAPC. And um, they concur that while not a mandate, that the final product would be formally presented to the count, town council kind of as a, a de facto standard. So I uh, appreciate the mayor chiming in and uh, I strongly believe I don't necessarily appreciate when I say this. No, I don't, I don't like saying this, but uh, since we went through the morass that we went through the last time, I think some of us lost faith in our planning board. And I haven't seen a lot of change in the planning board. I have faith in the planning department, but I would really, um, Mr. Mayor, I would really hope that this comes before the council because albeit uh, you and I know, we all know on this, on this phone call that there is a legislative branch and an executive branch and ultimately this is not a legislative function. And I understand that, but the residents don't. And the residents believe we should be integrally involved. And so I appreciate your consideration and your thought on that. Uh, and with that said, I'll leave that alone because I think you, I heard you loud and clear and I appreciate that and I appreciate the fact it was brought up. Separately, um, I have concern over the cost. And the reason I say that is because I sent a series of questions and issues and I got res uh, resolution on many of them. Uh, but if we have a collation of documents that already exist and three of the uh, parties, uh, three of three other, um, hold on one second. Three other towns, although they may be towns, we're still a town. Three of the towns referenced in the documentation have done the same thing, Hingham for 145, Medfield for 150, and Situate for 100. And if we're saying we have a lot of the documents um, available to us and they may just need modification, and in my commentary, I, I really feel that we have experts in our planning department. Um, I'd like a response as to why we couldn't put a, uh, a cap on this for 150,000. I'll go mute while I hear a response. Yeah, Kokoros, or who want, anybody want to address that? I would uh, refer to um, to Stickney if she's on the line. Yep, Director Stickney, you just need to unmute. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, so to, in response to why the amount, I didn't look at those those were communities that recently had master plans done in the last, say, 2020, 2019. I don't know how old their master plans were prior to that. So um, I couldn't answer that why theirs are cheaper because it could be an update of a prior master plan. We didn't get into the details of it. We just took a look at what the prices were. But um, Braintree has a lot of complexities, unlike those communities because of the uh, split between residential and business community. Um, Hingham is starting to evolve into some of those issues, but um, the other is, I don't know what the ratio is of residential to business. Councillor O'Brien. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so I, I um, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd vote to uh, modify the motion. Uh, I, I, I'm sure, I don't see any other hands raised, and, but we still have to go through the, um, through the members of the community. I'd like to hear from the public, but uh, I, th I think we should max it out at 150. Let's review some of the documentation we already have. I went through that housing plan 
uh, which is um, written as different than just a generic housing plan, but most of the things that uh, we probably want to address are in that housing plan, not not all of the master plan. What I'm saying is that housing plan, even though it's dated, is pretty comprehensive. I just think it needs to be tweaked and modified. So uh, I, I would vote, um, I, I'd feel more comfortable if we, we maxed it out at 150. And if you have to come back to us for more, come back to us for more. But again, I'm gonna mute and uh, I'd like to hear from the public. All right, we're in the public hearing right now. So if you wanna change that, when we get to the motion council, Brian, address that at that point. Any other counselor wish to speak on this before I open it up to the public? Seeing no counselors, Solicitor Taub. Thank you, Madam President. The only thing that I would add is that the 200,000 being requested to fund the master plan is coming from two different funding sources, which I think is important. $64,492.20 uh, were seeking to be transferred from the planning department's updated zoning article with the balance of $135,507.80 to be transferred from free cash for a total amount of $200,000. So I did think it was important to note the two different funding sources um, that we're seeking to have the, the transfers made in order to fund the master plan process. Thank you, Solicitor Tom. Councilor O'Brien. Thank you. I appreciate that, Solicitor Tom. And, and I concur. I saw that. I do recognize that. Um, I think the mayor is fully aware, as you are, that uh, we're in unprecedented times. And I think uh, although 50 grand isn't going to make a difference in, in the scheme of things, we, we definitely have 50 grand less in uh, food tax coming in. We definitely have 50 grand less in hotel tax coming in. I think if we can, uh, we can curb it. Um, I think would be better off. So um, I, I'm going to make a modified motion and um, we'll see where it goes. But um, I guess we got to come out of the public meeting for that. Council Barica, you wanted to speak. Thank you, President Hume. Um, just to that point, Councilor O'Brien, um, those were my very concerns at the last council meeting. Um, and between then and now, I did have the opportunity to speak with our town auditors. They alleviated that concern for me um, with the expected reduced revenues. Um, they both or you know, they felt comfortable that we would not overly burden our free cash uh, reserves. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you are aware the Ways and Means Committee did address that issue uh, at our meeting on Thursday night. Thank you, Council Barica. Uh, Council O'Brien. And then I'm going to let the auditors weigh in here, too, if you um, yeah. would, please. Council O'Brien. Oh, you need to unmute. Hold on, Council O'Brien, you need to unmute. We can't hear you. Oh, I did. And then I got Okay. <laughs> I appreciate that, Council Barica. Um, and, um, you know, I. I I come to this with a uh, hat in hand because I, I agree that we're probably going to end up spending it. But if we could save money, if, if, you know, some of my concerns were in fact that we're going to just collate documentation that already exists. Um, and if we weren't, if I got responses that said, no, we're going to start from, from scratch, so to speak, then I would go forth with the 200,000. But it looks to me like we're just going to scrub some of the uh, existing documentation. And so, I don't think there's a lot of heavy lifting and uh, I think we'll all agree that uh, the zoning is where we need to spend our money. Uh, zoning is something that needs to be updated and I'm sure that uh, Director Stickney will you know, agree with me on that. The zoning is where we're gonna have to spend our money again because what we did recently was thrown out, thank goodness. Um, so I think if we can uh, shave 50 grand off here and, and granted there's some money left from the previous zoning I think we shave the 50 off here. We'll make it up when we go to the um, to the final zoning. I'll stand back. All right, thank you. Well, I, hold on, Director Stick. There, I just just want to your point, Council O'Brien, of the old zoning. I had a conversation with Mayor Kikoros about the comprehensive zoning. There were some things in there that were are, are good and will protect the neighbors and are things that residents were wanting. So some of those will be incorporated into the future. I don't know if uh, Mayor Kokoros or Director Stickney, you want to address that. I'm not asking for the specifics, but you are going to incorporate 
some of those things in the future, correct? I see Councillor Ryan. I didn't know if I'm, I'm supposed to speak. Director Stigney, go ahead, and then I'm going to get to Councillor Ryan. Okay, the only other thing I was going to add is the difference, too, at this point in time is the census is coming out this year and the demographics and some of the housing and the uh, incomes. All that data will have to be done. The, le the prior reports that Councillor O'Brien is referencing are all based on the 2010 census. So we would be bringing everything up to the 2020 census. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Councillor Ryan. Hi, thank you, Madam Chairman. We're not coming up with the table of contents for the master plan tonight. We're not gonna, you know, decide the master plan tonight. We're voting for the funding for the master plan tonight. I think we're getting a little far afield with the discussion. We should be talking about the funding and making a motion to approve the funding. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Otter, does you want to weigh in on the funding? Dan Sullivan or Sean McGoldrick, our internal auditors. Thank you, Council President. Um, the only thing I want to add is just the conversation that um, um, uh, Council Bork and I had the other day was just that for the $200,000 for a master plan, um, I felt was in line with other communities. Um, in fact, there was another community I was at that day who had just passed a master plan last fall for I believe it was 150, 160K. Um, a smaller community than Braintree. So in the grand scheme of things, I did not see um, a concern with the amount of money uh, called for for this funding of the master plan. Thank you, Sean. Okay, any other council? Because we're gonna move on to the public if no other council wishes to speak. All right, Jill Coyle from the public. Thank you, Councilor, uh, President Hume. This is Jill Coyle, uh, Parkside Ave resident, and um, referring to a prior speaker, I would like to thank him for bringing up the guidance that MAPC gives on their website pertaining to the normal voting body, not required by law, however, being involved in the process, as we did in 1998, where the um, town meeting actually voted in the, the master plan. Um, also, uh, comments pertaining to the prior, uh, prior speaker. I would strongly suggest that we leave the funding at the current um, dollar amount, mainly because if you don't spend it, you have the money left in the budget to use for whatever may be needed. And given the situation right now and the future of the budgets and, and what is happening, it would be very difficult to go back I'm, I'm anticipating it would be very difficult to go back and get more money for the master plan if you need it and it's not there due to other very pressing issues and you're stuck with a partial plan that you can't finish. Um, and then my last comment pertains to um, the RFP process that I'm just familiar with. I'm not extremely experienced with it. But as far as the um, RFP, I believe this was going to be put out to professional land use consultants. And because of my unfamiliar, not being familiar with the process, would that exclude, exclude engineering firms? And the reason I ask that is because 20 something years ago, the Cecil group developed the master plan we have. They also used um, three other consultants to help them prepare it. And I would hope that we could possibly include them in the loop or find out if they still have Braintree's information because if they did, that would be a cost savings. It would also allow them to, to hit the ground running because they would have their own files. They wouldn't have to be out and violating social distancing. They could really start right away. Um, I just wanted to bring up uh, those few issues and that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Coyle. Anybody else from the public wish to speak? Seeing none. Okay, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved, Madam President. Second. There's been a motion made by Councilor Ringus, seconded by Councilor Ryan. Clerk Samina will roll call, please. 
Does Councillor O'Brien have a raised hand? Oh, I'm sorry. He does. Okay, sorry about that. That's all right. Or just go ahead, Councillor O'Brien. I was hoping to catch it before we made that uh, motion, but um, just one last question. So um, I may be coming off the cliff here. Uh, for Director Stickney, and I realize this is financial, but it's all related to financial. All this discussion is related to the finances because the, the, um, the project itself has to be funded accordingly so we end up with a good project, so, uh, product, I should say. So for Director Stickney, you mentioned about the 2020 census, but how long does it take for the 2020 census information to trickle down? Because I would think this is a train that left the station and uh, we can't wait for the census to be done to move forward with this. If I may, Madam Chairman. Council, uh, Director Stickney, yes. Go so ahead. we had proposed to break the um, proposal into two solicitations. The first one for the visioning expects to take about six months. There are, there are say a few months if we had to continue it. Um, census information, is starting to come in now in some of the preliminary reports, and that's usually what the consultants would begin with. And then towards the end of the report, they'll be probably, by the time the census information is out, because it's gonna take at least a year to do the elements, um, the final census numbers are there and they would plug them in at the end. Good, okay. All right, Clerk Samino, roll call vote, please. Thank you, Director Stickney. Council Derrica. I'm sorry, is this a motion to close the public hearing? Yes. 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 Council Connors. Aye. Council Flaherty. Okay, if you, yes. Thank you. Council Hume. Aye. Council Mackin. Yay. Council O'Brien. Yay. Council Ringus? Aye. Council Ryan? Yes. Council Sasha? Yes. Nine in favor. Okay, that means unanimous. The public hearing is closed. Council Ringus, is there a motion? Uh, Madam President, I would move that the amount of $64,492.20 be transferred from the Planning and Community Development Department updating zoning ordinance article and $135,507.80 be transferred from the FY 2019 certified free cash for a total of 200,000 to planning and community development department master plan article. Second for discussion. Is that a motion made by Councilor Ringus, seconded by Councilor O'Brien for the purposes of discussion. Councilor O'Brien. Uh, as you all know, I'm not on the uh, Ways and Means Committee, and so I want to highlight the fact that I appreciate uh, Chairman Barricky's concerns. I appreciate the Ways and Means uh, diligence on this. I appreciate everyone's patience for allowing me to send it back to Committee for Reconsideration. I appreciate the um, previous speaker who chimed in on the funding, uh, and I value that person's opinion. Not that I don't value anyone else's, but she's got a long um, uh, history with uh, planning departments, if you will. And I also, as usual, appreciate our auditor's input. So I will be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Brien. There's been a motion made and seconded. Uh, Clerk Samino, roll call vote, please. Council Barica. Yes. Council Connors. Yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Councillor Hume. Aye. Councillor Mackin. Aye. Councillor O'Brien. Hallelujah. Councillor Ringus. Aye. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Councillor Sasha. Yes. Nine in favor. Zero opposed. Unanimous. All right. Thank you all. Okay. Uh, I don't know if everyone else is going to stick around, but thank you to the auditors and to the mayor's office and ways and means. I know we spent a lot of time on that work, uh, master plan discussion, so appreciate all the work all of you who were involved done, did on that. There is no new business, so we will be moving on to referrals. Councilor uh, Rangus. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I would move to refer to the Committee on Ways and Means. Uh, order 20038 Mayor, uh, FY 2021 operating budget or taking up any action relative thereto. 
Second. There's been a motion made by Council Ringus, seconded by Council Ryan. Clerk Smino, roll call vote. Madam Chairman, would it Council be appropriate that he makes all four motions at once and we take one vote on him? I don't That'd see a problem with that. Anybody, no objections? Councilor Ringus. I would also move uh, the refer to the Committee on Ways and Means, uh, order number 20039, Mayor, FY 2021 Budget Community Preservation Committee, or take up any action relative there too. Additionally, for referral to the Committee on Ways and Means, order number 20040, Mayor, FY 2021 Budget Revolving Accounts, or taking up any action relative there too and referral to the Committee on Ways and Means 20041 Mayor FY20 Supplemental Appropriation or or take up any action relative thereto. Second. There's been a motion made by Councilor Ringus, seconded by Councilor O'Brien. Clerk Samino, roll call vote please. Councilor Barica? Yes. Council Connors? Yes. Council Flaherty? Yes. Councilor Hume? Aye. Council Mackin? Yes. Council O'Brien. Yay. Council Ringus. Aye. Council Ryan. Uh, yes. Council Sasha. Yes. Nine in favor. That is unanimous. Okay, our upcoming meeting will be Tuesday, May 12th at 7.30 p.m. We will pro be conducting our meetings via Zoom given the governor's stay at home order being extended today. I just want to thank Steve Larry with the mayor's office and Andrew Marin with the school department for their continued help and support with these Zoom meetings for all of us. Um, they are the masters behind the technology to make us all look good and for all of you at home so you can see it. Also, BCAM is televising this in the future. They are with us tonight recording it. Uh, check out their website, their Facebook page, whatever Bill Needham is with us. So thank you, Bill. Shout out to you. You do a great job. I uh, appreciate you getting all this information out to the residents. So with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So Roll moved, Madam President. Second. Then a motion made in second. Clerk Smino, roll call to adjourn. Council Barica. Yes. Council Connors. Yes. Council Flaherty. Yes. Council Hume. Aye. Councilor Mackin? Yes. Councilor O'Brien? Yay. Councilor Ringus? Aye. Councilor Ryan? Yes. Councilor Sasha? Yes. All in favor? All right. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.